Hey there guys, uh, this is a little broadcast and the title is what have they got in store for us next. So a lot of you might have seen on other YouTube uh, people talking about uh, Cyber Polygon. It's the new Event 201. So as you will know if you watch this channel and follow the alternate media, last year in October the World Economic Forum in conjunction with Bill Gates all the, usual sub sub all the usual suspects, should I say, did this uh, scenario building exercise, which basically replicated what happened with COVID. So they at it again with their scenario building, and this time they're calling it Cyber Polygon, and they're talking about the threat of a massive sort of cyber attack and a power down. So that is what I want to talk about today. So you can see there in the picture, we've got Klaus Schwab himself. I'm going to chat about a few other things as well. So just thrown in there. Well, Let's just get to the right screen. Okay, there we go. So I hope that's uh, got the right thing on there. Let's just check. Yes. Uh, as you can see, the level of technology on this program is improving a little bit. So there's old Klaus Schwab, uh, architect of the Great Reset. A lot of people have been talking about his books where he is going on about what seems to me a demonic plan for total human subjugation and rule by a technocratic elite. It's the Internet of Things, it's Agenda 2020, Agenda 2030, all rolled into one. Um, it's making us slaves, carbon taxes, impoverishing, back to feudalism. You could call it fascism on the top because it's this power structure of the corporations with the uh, politicians and communism on the bottom because we'll, we'll be all kind of equal in our misery. So you've heard me talk about that before, so let's move on. But, you know, come on, these guys are beyond parody. Look at this outfit. It's like half a, a, what is he doing, like a monk crossed with Star Trek with this ridiculous wide-shouldered padded jacket in bronze. I mean, who do these people think they are? <laughs> it's almost like they want to act like it's a joke. It's almost like they're laughing in our faces. I, I, I need to analyze this too, don't you think? Um, yeah, I should have looked at this more. That almost looks like a bull, as in Taurus the bull with a cross coming out of its head, a star. Very interesting. I should have analyzed that as well, but that's not the purpose of today's little chat. But uh, before we continue, just wanted to throw in a little few tidbits. Look at this from a newspaper in Australia. Compulsory vaccination legislation in Australia. Penalty, 66,600 Aussie dollars. Ridiculous. Uh, this hasn't been tested in court yet, it's being, uh, but they're trying to push this through. But don't you love the number 666? They just got to put it in there. They know that it's going to trigger people and people go, oh, it's the mark of the beast. And, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know why they do it. Is it because for their sick uh, karma, they need to show us what they're doing? I don't know. But there it is, you guys. I mean, of all the numbers for a fine, absolutely ridiculous. Fine, isn't it? That's what you're going to be fine if you don't take the, the, the oh, let's just call it the poison. I'm not going to call it that because you can't monetize videos as soon as you've talked about the forbidden subject. You guys in the UK will know who Rishi Sunak is. For you guys in the rest of the world, he's the Chancellor of the Exchequer. In other words, he's control, control of the finances of the country and control of the budget. In the Daily Mail today, here's an article. Will millionaire Rishi Sunak profit from the new Moderna? Moderna as in the Bill Gates Fauci effort. Uh, coronavirus poison. Chancellor refuses to say if he still has money in a hedge fund he founded that's a major investor in this pharmaceutical manufacturer. Well, Moderna was only purchased by Gates in 2019. So if he's a major investor in it, he obviously was in the know, as anyone running a hedge fund would be, because hedge funds is a byword for a globalist corporatist bassist, probably. Yeah. So very interesting. What's most interesting now, what is the name of his hedge fund, guys? Have a guess. There it is. Thalimi or Thalim partners. And what was the name of the religion founded by Alistair Crowley? Thalima. Again, it's like the 666. Now it's Alistair Crowley. You know, come on, it's so in our faces, you know. But I guess the sheep out there is, no, of course he doesn't. He wouldn't do that. Oh, uh, yes, he would. Next one I'd like to mention before we get on to the cyber polygon is the DOD. Operation Warp Speed Team Developing Computer Platform Tiberius. So again, like in the name Thalimi, allusion to Thalima, what is the name Tiberius? Now, if you look in the uh, 12 Caesars by Sidonis and you read all about Tiberius, I would say the perfect uh, way to describe him is saying he was a Roman Epstein. He had an island. On the island, there were lots of sex slaves. 
There were manuals on how to give the perfect treatment. There were lots of bad stuff going on. Just think Epstein, think Tiberius. I mean, these were two T's in a pod. It's almost like the Epstein is a modern day version. You know, again, it's, it's uh, not life imitating art. It's life imitating history. So why would they choose the name Tiberius of all names? You know, you tell me those people don't think of something. Why do they use that name? I mean, it's just mighty odd, isn't it? Little note. Now, a lot of you guys who follow the American politics will know that Trump said under warp speed, the vaccines are ready, blah, blah, blah. He said they won't be mandatory. Andrew Cuomo doesn't like Trump's vaccine. He says people mustn't take it. I suppose he's waiting for Gates's vaccine. Doesn't really matter. But uh, the interesting thing is Trump has arranged for the vaccine to be delivered on a private basis, whereas Cuomo fam favors a more government organized basis. So uh, if you just use your imagination a little bit, if the vaccine's privately delivered, well, you know, there can be conversations taking place, can't they? There can be a little bit of money under the counter, whatever's going on. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, use your imagination. But if it's more government backed, then you've got the force, put the police behind it. It's the authoritarian, isn't it? So there's less scope to make a little deal of your own. So maybe that's why Coma is not so keen on it. Just just an idea. I mean, I'm, I'm a fiction writer. I'm probably just fantasizing. I'm sure it's nothing of the sort. I'm sure it's all totally innocent and I'm sure everyone has the best intentions and I'm sure the whole thing's going to go A-OK -okay and that everyone's ticked every box and that everyone is above board. I'm certain of it. Of course it would be that way. So let's talk about Cyber Polygon. Now, I know a lot of people on the alternative media were saying, oh, it's a simulation and it's definitely going to play out. Well, I'll, I'll say again, if, if they've thought of something, they're probably already doing it. They've probably already done it. So chances are, if they're talking about this Cyber Polygon, which is the threat of a worldwide cyber attack by a malicious uh, third party, which is <laughs> we know who's going to be behind it, don't we? Uh, Russians, of course. Yeah. And uh, causing us to have an electricity blackout, sort of nuclear power stations failing because they've been hacked, all that sort of thing. Now, the one thing is they do do the simulation every year. So it's not like they've just, it's a one-off. But I've discovered something more nefarious that other people haven't yet looked at. So we're going to look at it together. So I've copied these little slides from the World Economic Forum site. You can put in there Cyber Polygon, which if it's too small, it's C-Y-B-E-R, new word, P-O-L-Y-G-O-N. Have a look at it on the World Economic Forum. I've got the section agenda, the tag agenda. It's got welcoming remarks by Klaus Schwab, of course, you know, the uh, good looking bald dude with a watermelon head in the, uh, I don't know, monk crossed with Star Wars outfit. He is of course the founder the founder, no less, and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum. He's an Aries, by the way. Sorry, Aries. Sorry to bring you that news. So, Stream 1 was an uncertain future. What cyber risks will the accelerated global digitization bring? Okay, yeah, well, all right. Fairly self-explanatory. Let's look at the next section. So, it's got dialogue. This was the discussion going on between 12.30 and 1 o'clock. Imagine actually having to sit through these ridiculous people talking about this stuff. Anyway, it says a time of change, how 2020 is transforming our attitude to digitization. He says, it's been many years since the fourth industrial revolution started. Oh really, has it been many years since it started? Because it seems a lot of people are in denial that it's even happening. Funny, he says it started ages ago. Everyone else says it's a conspiracy theory, but anyhow. So he says, this event has basically divided people into two groups, those who believe in digital prosperity and the skeptics who have reasons to doubt the new technology and the opportunities that it offered. No, no, it's the difference between those who have a demonic need for plutocratic and total control and who plan to use this for it, and those of us who understand what's being done under the name of technology and are standing up to it. That's more accurate. He says, now we are seeing a change in the situation. Following the outbreak of COVID, the world found itself in a state where it no longer had a choice but to use digital communications. Well, funny how we didn't have a choice, isn't that so? So all those of us who didn't believe in it, now we've got no choice. How convenient for them. Uh, then this, the people who gave this talk were Herman Grief, CEO, chairman of the executive board of Sh S 
Shi Burbank, sorry, I'm saying that wrong. I don't know how you pronounce S followed by B. And guess who else gave the speech? Ah, oh, drum roll, the Right Honourable Tony Blair. Oh, gosh, how exciting. Former Prime Minister. It says here Prime Minister Great Britain and Northern Ireland. They should say former. They do give the dates. But, I mean, honestly, popping his head up again. The usual suspects we see. Then they go on to trust or fear. What will be the main incentive for cooperation after the crisis? I guess there won't be incentive. I guess the incentive is more like a uh, coercion would probably be a better word. So it says, when a crisis comes and we need help, there are two main feelings that drive people to reach out to others, trust and fear. Yeah, isn't that the uh, kind of problem reaction solution? Create a crisis, get people reaching out in fear to others who they supposedly trust, who some trust. Anyway, it says, we can call on those we trust. Uh, no, we can't. There aren't any of those in power. In fact, they're doing their best to get rid of the only person I just a little bit trust, <laughs> Donald Trump. Okay, he says, we do it in the fear of not being able to cope with it ourselves. However, if the latter feeling is quick to catch, the former needs a lot more time and effort to be built. During the pandemic, we all witnessed a rise of cyber crime. Did we? Did we really witness a rise of cybercrime? I witnessed a rise in medical and political corruption, personally. And I also experienced a loss of personal freedom. And I experienced a total collapse of trust in the mainstream media, which I didn't have very much, but I'm flabbergasted at how shameful they are. So uh, one thing I didn't experience was cybercrime to any greater extent than normal. Apparently, he thinks it's a big problem. He said, and we came together to deal with it. Uh, no, we didn't. He said, but what will drive and influence the global community after this crisis? Well, unfortunately, probably you, Mr. Crazy Fashion Idea Person. So he says, will we be able to build trust and join forces against cybercrime? Or will we need another crisis to unite us once again? You see, there they will we need another crisis. Reminds me of the, uh, the whole thing about the new Pearl Harbor. You know, we'll need a new crisis to unite us. In other words, you will need a new crisis to consolidate your power. And yes, but the biggest problem you have is that us, the 99%, may just unite against your demonic plan. Anyway, so uh, Jeremy Jurgens, who's chief business officer and member of the managing board of the World Economic Forum, gave that speech. If you see him, he looks like a... Remember that joke about people whose parents used to put a pot on their head and then cut around to do a haircut? Yeah, I think his mom's still doing that for him. Then we've got building secure, interconnected world. What is the role of the telecom sector? It says the coronavirus pandemic has given a boost to digitization. The world is becoming increasingly interconnected, which is what they want. You know, globalization, 5G. In this whole scenario where they're discussing this um cyber polygon they're using exactly the same language like they did with COVID. global problems need global solutions they said pandemics don't respect borders cyber criminals don't respect borders therefore we need global responses you know it's all the same language then he says various spheres of life are going online systems are being automated data is being exchanged without human involvement yeah more and more ai he mentions 5g ai Internet of Things. You see, they'll tell you Internet of Things is a conspiracy, but there it is. There it is. Now, he says, things act as a catalyst to these processes, but at the same time, they create new opportunities for cyber criminals. How to protect business users in this new environment and what is the role of the telecom sector in creating a truly secure digital world? Now, guys, hold on to that word cyber criminals because you guys are all thinking about some, I don't know, some hackers in Siberia or I don't know, Chile, Turkey, uh, Scotland, wherever they are. You're thinking of cyber criminals. You're thinking of hackers. Wrong. Wait and see what comes next. Just in case you want to know, Sebastian Tolstoy, uh, head of Eastern Europe and Central Asia and general director of Ericsson in Russia, gave that speech. And Alexei Konia, president and CEO and chairman of the management board of MTS, also contributed to that particular video. Here's the crux. That's why I said... Keep in mind what you thought when they said digital uh, cyber criminals. So it says next, fake news, a new digital pandemic. So the new pandemic is fake news. Well, I agree, actually, except I would say the biggest purveyors of fake news are everyone in the mainstream media. So it says many people say information is the most powerful weapon on Earth. Information will continue spreading as long as there are people on the planet. 
Digital communication channels make this easier and faster. Cyber criminals take advantage of this phenomenon. Do you see here the kicker? They are now conflating a cyber criminal with someone spreading fake news. So I'm a cyber criminal probably. So is um, Alex Jones, Jay Dyer, um, Nick Fuentes, uh, Max Egan, Polly, Amazing Polly. We're uh, that's who they're saying are the cyber criminals, right? Making so it says cyber criminals will take advantage of this phenomena, making fake news one of the most powerful tools used to their advantage. Does that mean that we will become even more dependent on digital channels and fake news will become one of the main threats to humanity? Insidious. This is what they're thinking of. Fake news is a main threat to humanity. You get that, guys? They are coming after anyone telling the truth. This is going to be censorship on steroids now. This is what they're thinking of. Never mind power downs and blackouts. This is about coming with for anyone who's putting the alternative viewpoint so the media can cement themselves. You know, it, it, worse than Pravda and Investia and all that. Guess who gave this speech? Nick Gowan from BBC World News. Gee, <laughs> BBC, the lovers of free speech, and Vladimir Posner, a lot of Russians involved. At the beginning, I was looking at this conference thinking, is this going to be a pretext to uh, go after Russia, saying, oh, they're doing all the cyber crime, let's have war against Russia. But a lot of Russians involved in this. So, yeah. And it says, know your enemy, how the crisis is changing the cyber threat landscape. And it says cyber criminals, which is truth tellers, basically, are using global instability to their advantage. The number of cyber attacks rose dramatically because of the pandemic. Nonsense. The amount of truth being spoken rose dramatically as more and more people realized they were being lied to. How does this affect the threat landscape during these times? What is to be expected from cyber criminals in the upcoming months and years and how to stop them? Yeah. Control, control, authoritarian, totalitarian control. This is just about the thought police. And I, I don't think we need to know who gave. Someone from IBM called Wendy and Donya Thacker from Trend Micro gave that speech. So you see, guys, other people missed that. I know a couple of guys on the uh, alternate stream covered the cyber polygon and they said, oh, is we're going to have this you know, blackout. I know that Max Eigen said maybe there will be an internet and an electricity blackout and when everything comes off back online, certain people have disappeared. But do you realize we should all, guys, if you still have a landline, exchange your landline phone with everybody. So if we have a blackout, you're not reliant on your mobile or your internet to get in touch with friends, family and, and important people. Give your landline, if you still have one, phone number out to simply everybody and make sure that you're all writing these things down in an old fashioned diary. All right, we need to keep track. We're too reliant on phone numbers in, in books. We don't, you know, in our phone, we don't remember numbers. So there you go. Um, you know, why are you are we looking at this? It will make sense immediately to those of you in the UK. It's HS2, which is a high speed train project. It was uh, mooted for a long time. They began work on it. Boris Johnson has finally given it the go ahead. Very disliked because of the damage to nature and because people think it's a very, very expensive white elephant that's only going to enrich cronies. I'm going to mention it because a lot of you guys who live in maybe, I know there is a project in Austin for some sort of train line that's very unpopular, but you know, it, it, it was voted through on this election and around the world you may be seeing these major infrastructure projects. So keep a look out for them. Now in the UK, these are not stops, all these little blue balloons. It's, it goes between London and Birmingham, cuts 15 minutes off the time, which is really nothing. It's about a two hour trip, really. Cutting 15 minutes off is barely here nor there, especially when the World Economic Forum says we mustn't be doing business travel. This business travel is not useful. So people are working at home, why do we need this train? Then you can see you guys who were, live overseas, it also connects major cities in the center north of England, Leeds, Sheffield, and over the side Manchester doesn't go as far as Liverpool so it's connecting the major city of London to the major cities in the north not as far as Newcastle maybe Birmingham which is our second largest city Leeds is a pretty big city uh, where a lot of uh, financial services are etc and obviously Manchester is a very important city so it's connecting all those now I had my doubts over whether this project was a pretext for something else but you what you can see on the surface it is it's a global cities initiative so everyone under Agenda 2030 corralled into the very big cities and then no one's really living in the country. All this becomes Wildlands or the Woodlands Project where very, very few people, only the ultra-rich, you know, the people who play polo and have horses and 
that. Um, they'll live there. And of course, forget farming because Bill Gates is into digital food and you know, 3D printed food. And uh, excuse my language, he's into shit burgers. I, I don't know if you guys have heard that one, but he's actually advocating making burgers out of shit. Well, I, I recommend them to him. I really do. I think he should, should feast on them as much as he wants. Uh, it, it is disgusting, but there is an attack on farming. As you can see, was it Oxford University that said this week, students don't want any meat. They only want veganism in the canteens because they want to save the planet by having, you know, no meat. So obviously we're not going to need a lot of this farming land. And uh, I don't know, we'll be eating synthetic food. Maybe we don't need to grow wheat and maize anymore. I don't know. But we're going to be crawled in the cities, which is why they need to connect the cities with this big train. Uh, I was recently, hi James Long, I hear you live in Leamington, nice to hear from you. I was up near Leamington and they are currently constructing a major tunnel uh, in that area. So the main road, the A45 between Leamington goes through South and Banbury is closed off. So uh, it's an issue that came to my attention, was close to my heart ages too, because I saw all this work they were doing on, the, uh, on it. And I, I just wondered, is it really about a train? Or is it an excuse to do a major infrastructure project regarding tunnels? Now, why my mind drifted? Years ago, I used to listen to James Whale. So you guys in the UK will know him. If you're not in the UK, he used to be one of our most controversial, outspoken radio hosts. He used to have guests like David Icke and Alex Jones on. He was open to conspiracies. Unfortunately, he lost his job in 2010 by being a little bit too outspoken about the uh, London mayoral election. And, and after that, he went very quiet. And now he doesn't really cover any topics that are out there. But he used to be very good on them. He did the late night show like 10 till 1 in the morning. And he used to get a lot of interesting callers. So at the time, in the early 2000s, they were building an extension on the tube line to the Jubilee line. And a caller rang him one night and faxed in plans. And he said he was a uh, engineer. And he said that the extension to the Jubilee line was a pretext to build a huge bunker under the Houses of Parliament, which is conceivable because it runs roughly past there. Last stop used to be Charing Cross, which is very close to the houses to Trafalgar Square. And then they ran it further south. And he sent the plans and he said they'd all signed gagging orders. And he said they were actually felt, well, he said, I mean, I can't verify if he was fantasizing or whatever, but he was pretty certain that all the engineers working on it were, um, you know, well, scared of what he called being kind of head of a wet job done on them for extreme prejudice if they talked about it. So he said that it, they weren't just constructing a tube. They were tunneling underground to make bunkers. And you read... In the history of England, there's lots of underground tunnels linking churches to local guest houses, linking churches to other areas of tunnels, should I say, linking churches to manor houses, linking different areas of little villages. You know, they used to do a lot of this tunneling back in the old days, even in this little village we stayed in near Leamington. There's lots of stories of the kids used to play in the tunnels. They really do exist. And they're there from maybe medieval times, right? Uh, who knows? I, I'm just wondering. I'm just putting it out there. I don't know. I'm just wondering whether this tunneling is a pretext for some other sort of underground project going on. So that's why that HS2, you guys may, uh, wherever you live in the world, also know that there are major infrastructure projects going on, which have a apparent reason but might have a more interesting reason as well uh just a little one to end off apparently this guy called the benition he is a uh, an artist a comedian kind of guy he is launching a private criminal prosecution against matt hancock under common law rules there is a move in the uk to re-establish common law courts to deal with humans in the common law and circumvent the statute law which really only should be dealing with corporations it's a way of getting around a corrupt system uh, it's quite interesting i don't know how effective it could actually be but he is uh, yeah he's he's actually got a claim you can see it here if you look under the benition common law prosecution matt hancock you'll find it there as you see it some of it is redacted but we've got urgent application for warrant for arrest ray um People's Union of Britain, the Common Law Court, versus Matt Hancock, Secretary of State for Health. Obviously, you guys, Matt Hancock's behind a lot of the draconian laws going around for coronavirus, etc. So it's quite interesting that people... Uh, also, if you guys were watching, there was a protest in Ireland 
for um, against COVID, against the lockdown, against the lies, of distributing truth. Three Gaudi or God uh, approached and they all started shouting, we have no contract with you, which is a common law concept where you say, I do not stand under the authority of the police. If you want to know more, David Icke has got a program on this where he speaks to a guy called John Smith from the common law court. It's on band.video and it's also must be on David's site. You can go there. It was look for about two weeks back. There was this show. It'll tell you all about common law, how to try and be governed by common law and be free of statute. I can't say how effective this is. It's an interesting concept. We should all research it. And certainly worked for these Irish protesters because as soon as they all chanted to the police, um, we have no contract with you, they actually walked away and stopped bothering them. I think they were going to disperse them under, under some COVID act, but they did walk away. So very interesting that. Just like to end off by saying here we've got, this is in Portuguese, right? But uh, what it's telling you is that the Portuguese Supreme Court has uh, thrown out the lockdown by saying the test is not fit for purpose. So this Portuguese Supreme Court looked at the PCR test, said, hang on, you can't have a, a lockdown on the basis of, of this test because it doesn't work. And then they, um, I don't know, they've, they've thrown out the lockdown le legislation. Obviously, it's in Portuguese, but that's the gist of it. You guys can use that information there to go and have a look yourself if you understand Portuguese. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, I hope this new recording system went well and everything made sense and you saw what I was showing you there. Um, all interesting stuff, guys. I must say the election, it's gripping. It's the most gripping drama ever. I just hope that, well, you know, obviously it sounds incredibly positive, incredibly overwhelming. It sounds like the evidence is absolutely irrefutable when Rudy Giuliani and Sidney Powell lay it out. But you know, you just can't trust the system and you haven't heard their side. You know, opening day of court when the prosecutor lays out his case always sounds good. But, you know, you, you haven't heard what they have to say back, have you? They are obviously got lots of time to prepare their rebuttal. And they are going to throw billions and billions and billions at lawyers and have the best lawyers and pay off the judges. So sometimes it doesn't matter how good a case you've got when you're up against the system. So interesting stuff watching it obviously gripped and uh, nice to chat to you guys all hope you're all well uh, by the way always appreciate it if you buy one of my books i don't plug a lot but uh, i'm going to put some links to my books to my thrillers to my astrology books really appreciate any of you guys buying those because look youtube you can't monetize any of this stuff and BitChute, oh, I'm having such a problem uploading stuff there it takes absolutely ages and then the next thing it says oh you had an uh, like an internet break and then, and then it didn't upload so having a lot of trouble uploading but for now still on here take care everybody